hello and welcome to this week's video. We thought we'd mix it up a little bit this week and actually invite you to join us for a day's gardening. So we've got various projects um, lined up for today and thought it'd be quite fun um, to have you join us and um, share a few tips and tricks along the way. So hope you enjoy. Starting the day putting some dried elderflower and calendula into jars of storage. These are going to be used in teas um, this summer for our guests in our um, botanical bell tent in the botanical B&B. And yeah, beautiful. Now a super quick job I've got to do is pick the black lace elderflowers. So we planted these a couple of years ago, they're really small. Um, God, they're about a fifth of the size. Um, plants from Future Forest and I think 18 months, maybe two years later, um, they're absolutely huge. And they're, yeah, the most spectacular backdrop um, for the borders. A terrace borders which is which are running down to the front of it but um, we wanted something that would kind of divide the space and um, so these beautiful old walls finish and they've got a bit of a gap before the start of the path so we put these in and they're doing really really well so yeah first year we've actually got just tons and tons of blossom and you can see how many more are still to come but I noticed I've missed a few that actually gone over so right now uh, George is chasing a bird. <laughs> George! But um, yeah, back to the elderflower picking, which are going to go in that basket. So, elderflower all picked. I'll just show you now. Um, we were going to make elderflower and gooseberry jam, but the gooseberries aren't quite ripe. So, I'll actually, these ones I've picked and I'm going to use um, actually to do just to dry for teas. Um, but you can make into cordial, they make an amazing pink cordial and a beautiful pink um, champagne as well, absolutely stunning. Um, but these ones are going to be dried and it's as simple as piling them into a basket like this. I've kind of spread them out a little bit and those will go on the windowsill until they're dry, crisp. And then um, you just pull the, um, the leaves or the flowers off by um, rubbing them between your fingers and you'll just find they fall away from the stem and straight into your um, sealed airtight jar for storing and they'll keep for up to a year um, dried and sealed. A nice hole for them. So they're planted at about level with the pot basically. So make a nice, nice hole. In they go and then just cover them round. Just gently firm them in, and that's it. And then we'll obviously water them later, won't we? Yeah. Because they are quite a bit dry. These are just some of the gorgeous salvias that have been donated for the new tub planting. Um, and we've been really busy planting them today. There's been 47 in total gone, gone in the planters around the village. Um, and I'll just quickly show you some of the other things. We've got loads of fennel coming up. There's, um, we've been tying back the daffodils that are finished from the spring. Um, there's also loads of um, grape hyacinths that are finished. Um, so I'm just about to tie those back. Um, there's some nasturtium from, that have self-seeded from last year that are just coming up through. Um, there's a few surprises that have appeared. There's obviously some extra donations coming in that have been added. Um, we've got a drift of alliums coming up here, um, which will be flowering in the next couple of weeks. And this beauty down here is a um, dahlia. Um, so that'll be stunning. Um, there's oranges and yellows. They'll be flowering right through into the autumn, and then we've got a um, primula from the spring. So that's just finished flowering, and we'll leave these seed heads to um, to develop, and they'll self-seed around the planter as well. So we'll have even more of those 
over the coming years. And I'll just quickly show you with this planter, just to show you what diversity of planting there is, we've actually got tons and tons of California poppies. Um, so they're flowering away beautifully. Some of the ones that were just finishing up, we've, we've um, trimmed back to encourage some new growth. But yeah, here's some of the June berries just about ripen up. And one of the big planters down at the bottom of the village. I'm putting in some more donated plants today. And over here on the bridge there's loads and loads of sedum just about to come through. So they'll be flowering right the next couple of weeks right through into the autumn. Um, meadows have been left in the graveyard and look at all the oxide daisies they're amazing and the grasses are just looking incredible in the breeze you can see it but just there's drifts of all sorts of wildflowers just coming through there's a whole load over here there's the oxide daisies but yeah that would be brown at the moment um, if it had been cut it's just been so dry So the next big job I've got to do today is to finish um, the dead hedge. So we had some huge big conifers taken down over round about here um, a few weeks ago and we've just been so busy we haven't had a chance to actually clear all the brush so it's been bit by bit but um, today I'm hoping to finish it off. So I've been hauling over big massive piles of um, the branches and everything and they're gonna go on this dead hedge, which you can see behind me. Um, so yeah, it's just a case of hauling the branches and then weaving them in um, between these uprights that we've positioned along the way. That is it. That section of, hello George. Um, that section of dead hedge is now finished. I'll just walk along here so you can actually see. It's now got a green hairdo on top of all the material that's been previously added. You see? There it is. So yeah, you do, we just keep on adding whenever we have any material. Um, and it's just a fantastic way of letting um, nature make the most of this all this brush so it will rot down really really slowly and in the meantime it's a fantastic habitat for um, invertebrates it's like a huge bug hotel um, and it's also great for nesting birds so yeah build a dead hedge next thing we're actually doing is building our little bean pole areas we've got three lots of runner beans and French beans to plant so we're going to show you just how to do a structure. So we have made our runner bean and French bean frames and as you can see they're pretty solid. Now these were from trees that came down in the storms and the tops of other trees that we have taken down and used for structures. So they are very chunky and solid and they should last for quite a few years. Now this is obviously a frame that's going to be quite strong, you can see it doesn't move and that's mainly because we've got the diagonal braces. So that stops it from moving from side to side. Now if we get strong winds, which we seem to be getting a lot of at the moment, we want it to be strong. And it's very tall, so we should get a lot of beans, which I really want. I want maximum yield. And basically when we planted the beans, we put in a little bit of fertilizer. Now these are comfrey pellets. They're plant-based and they're full of potash and nitrogen. So that should really 
give the beans a bit of an extra boost. Now, we don't need to give them too much because beans will improve the soil themselves. However, a little bit of manure and compost in the bottom of the planting hole is always beneficial for beans. They are quite greedy. However, they will improve the soil as well with nitrogen through their nodules. But we want them to give them the best start possible. So, they're in. We've given them a little bit of a tie, probably not those. You can see on these ones, they've been tied in. And that's just to give them a little bit of structure because the wind will rock them. But we want to give them a head start, a bit of support in the early days. And then eventually they'll climb up, no support needed. And then all you have to do is pick, and I mean pick away because the beans will keep producing more than what you can pick. They're really amazing like that. So we've got two varieties. We have got runner bean and Norma. Very prolific, it's meant to do very well in Irish conditions. And the other one is Cherokee Trail of Tears. It's a climbing French bean. Climbing French beans are a little bit more delicate. They need definitely warmer conditions. Runner beans are a little bit more forgiving, but we're quite sheltered here and the weather has warmed up and the soil's a lot warmer now. So that's a nice purple bean. We can even save the, the beans in the pod for drying. So it's a really good variety. Very pretty, nice purple pod. And we're growing two types of runner bean. One, another one's called Zar, which is a butter bean type. So we can eat the pods or we can eat the beans to dry. So there we have it, good strong structures. You can make a wigwam obviously, but this is for maximum yield. And these rectangular beds, so it fits in perfectly. And they're very strong. And I love to see them with the rustic wood. Looks much better in the garden. Though. But these are the broad beans, Vectra. Uh, Irish Seed Savers gave me that seed and looking very healthy. I sowed these in the spring because in Ireland where it's very damp they don't seem to do very well from a wind autumn sowing although I've had different but here it's a no-go they just rot basically. So this is a spring sowing of Vectra so beautiful flowers and then we've got an Irish pea I mean it grows up to 1.8 meters it seems to be going beyond that I'm 1.85 meters and uh, it's already starting to go above and this is an Irish heritage variety hence its name and it's very prolific actually, massive leaves. Just wanted to show you the uh, onion bed and these are Japanese onions which means they went in in the winter time and they grow over winter they just slowly root down then come spring they go through with the bulbs. Now this is the best crop we've had usually they turn out like that at the very best but we put a lot of compost down last autumn and I think I'm you know reaping the benefits now. So what I want to show you on the other side with another Japanese onion, the red version, is I've turned the necks. Now it's almost like breaking the necks. So if you have a look down there, this is a very lovely onion. I wish I could remember what it's called. The label was in the polytunnel. And I've just turned the necks. Now I'll be eating these through the summer and um, by turning the necks, it just initiates the time to harvest them. So they will start to get ready to go down, get ready to be harvested. After a couple of days, I'll literally just start to lift and break away some of the roots. And again, this just makes them think it's ready to come up. And then after a couple more days, I'll pull them up, I'll dry them in the polytunnel. So the onions are doing really well for us. What I'm really excited to talk about is actually our potatoes. The very first video we did was planting potatoes. and. This is the result actually of what we've been doing. These are the two first earlies and they're just about ready to start coming up. So this is their almost 11th week actually. So around 10, 12 weeks is when you pull up your first earlies, your new potatoes. So what I'm gonna do, if you know, if you want to know if they're ready is just tickle the soil or tease it. Now we're just gonna have a little scrape, just a little scrape here. It'll be very gentle because if there is something, you don't wanna damage them. Oh, look at that. I never get bored of seeing potatoes when you're about to harvest them. It's like digging up treasure. So I can tell they're ready. That is a good new potato. And I'm actually really excited about that. So what I'll do is I'll cut the tops off. I'll dig up probably about a plant or two at a time. But by cutting all the tops off, that will keep the energy from going into tubers. We don't want to swell up anymore and uh, we'll be eating those hopefully tonight or tomorrow night. Now, one final thing we want to talk to you about is 
a little experiment we're doing here. Here we are growing our sweet corn in amongst the ditches, the, the sort of dips in amongst our main crop potatoes. Now the sweet corn will be harvested before the main crop potatoes, so we shouldn't have any problems there. But the water when it rains should, this is our theory, sit in, in amongst the dips and water the sweet corn. And obviously these won't be bothered, but also the foliage from the main crop potatoes will act as a bit of a mulch and keep the moisture locked in as well. So hopefully this works out quite well. Uh, this you can see we've done this. This is sweet corn called platinum. platinum so uh, hopefully we get a good crop. And we grow them in blocks anyway because we want that cross pollination. They're wind pollinated, so we plant them in blocks and hopefully they'll all pollinate with each other and we get some sweet corn. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching today. George is really excited. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the video. It's a little bit different to our usual how-tos, but we thought you just uh, you might enjoy actually just joining us in the garden and seeing what we're up to. Um, there's been a few hints and tips along the way that I hope you find useful. Um, if you'd like more of these, please do let us know. Um, so we're always beavering away in the garden, working on various projects, and we're more than happy to share um, and um, have you join us for some of that. Um, and yeah, any questions? Do um, sow them below and for more about Two Green Shoots um, and what we do from accommodation, um, which is now open from the 20th of July, right through to um, garden design, um, do visit www.twogreenshoots.com for all of that. We'll hopefully see you next week. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Oh. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs>